Hi, and welcome to our next episode in the journey with the Mother of Peace. In the last episode, we covered the Washington Monument Rally held in 1976, which turned out to be a tipping point for the movement. Critics desperately wanted us to fail, looking for any way to defeat the momentum that Father and Mother Moon had initiated. Persecution reached its zenith by the end of the 1970s. Eventually, it would get to the point that would send Father away and put our mother to the test with the, all the odds against her. But like always, she would be victorious. The title of this message is Mother Declares the Welcoming of a New Age. As a figurehead for the growing attacks on our movement, Congressman Donald Frazier took the lead, accusing father of being involved in the Koreagate scandal that was erupting in the media at the time. Of course, this scandal had nothing to do with us. The only connection was that father and mother were from Korea. Eventually, this long fought attempt to cripple father came to nothing, and the opposers were left irritated and empty handed. So they asked the IRS to investigate our organization in the hopes that they could find something. Mother describes the moment. Beginning in the late 1970s, our church was subjugated to a full IRS audit. We opened our books confident that we had done nothing wrong. For two years, we even provided a private office for an IRS team in our Manhattan headquarters building. I have lived a life of sacrifice and service for America and the world, Father Moon declared publicly. I have done nothing to be ashamed of. This case is the result of racism and religious prejudice. Father had done nothing wrong. But on October 15, 1981, the U.S. District Attorney from the Southern District of New York finally succeeded in lodging tax evasion charges against him. It was a witch hunt. They wanted to either jail him or dissuade him from working in America altogether. Let's go on. My husband was found guilty of owing a total of $7,300 in taxes accrued over a three-year period, nearly 10 years prior. It is routine for people who underpay their taxes by far greater amounts to simply pay a fine. But for Father Moon, an evangelist from Korea, the judge pounded his gavel and pronounced his decision. I sentence you to 18 months in prison and a $25,000 fine. Upon this announcement, my husband immediately stood up, smiled, and walked across the courtroom with his hand outstretched to shake the hand of the government's lead prosecutor. With this gesture, Father made the biggest statement that nothing will deter the will of God that father and mother will sacrifice everything for the sake of others if that's what it takes. This sentence sparked off a drama. Father had done nothing out of the ordinary. So if, if he could be framed with, framed with tax evasion, then so could just about every other church pastor who held funds in their own name. Listen. The government was prosecuting someone for what was a general church practice, and if they could send my husband to jail for that, it could send anyone to jail. So church leaders from various denominations spoke up in Father's defense. Nonetheless, in May of 1984, after years of battle, the Supreme Court washed its hands of the case and affirmed the sentence. Father Moon was going to jail. In a sense, the government had turned him into a martyr. And as bad as it was to jail him, Father knew that God could use this for a providential advantage. Mother remembers the moment. My husband's response? It is the will of God. He was not concerned about going to prison. 
he had already turned the court's decision into the next step of God's plan to awaken America from spiritual death. The Christian community united with us as it never had before. They proclaimed that when the government threw Father Moon in prison, it had thrown them in there as well. From now, a new world will begin, Father said. Now, not only in America, but all humanity will be with us, and the drumbeat of hope will sound throughout the world. Okay, I was about 11 years old at the time, living in Europe. I don't remember hearing anything about Reverend Moon's incarceration, but I imagine that for many outsiders watching, they may have felt as if it was the inevitable conclusion of the rise and fall of this unfamiliar movement from the East. I believe some of you may remember that day more personally, from Mother and the family and the members around the world. It was a dark moment that still weighs on Mother's heart until today. July 20, 1984, is a day I wish I could erase from history. On that day, my husband left our home and was incarcerated in Danbury Prison. As we departed at 10 that evening, he gave words of hope and encouragement to our members who had gathered at Belvedere. With several members, we drove to the prison. I was resolved not to reveal my emotions. Father Moon had asked the members to dispel their anger and sadness. Do not cry for me, he told them. Pray for America. Father was confident, but for the rest, it must have felt like a death. They were headed into the unknown. A feeling of deep darkness descended as we watched Father Moon enter the prison. We stood for a long time at the entrance, as if my husband might just turn around and come back out. With a sigh, I consoled everyone, and we turned and walked away. My husband was embarking on an unfair prison term in a foreign land, and I knew that I had to forgive the people who had put him there. The road was dark on their journey home that night. Can you imagine what was going on in Mother's heart after she left him there in Danbury? They had already been through so much, given so much, sacrificed so much, and overcome so much. All the while, Mother was at Father's side. But this night, Mother was alone. This night, Father had been taken from her. This night, Mother must have felt like she was carrying the cross of the world on her shoulders. And she would have to wake up the next morning, refreshed and ready to lead the worldwide movement. It was very hard on my mind and body. Amid all this, I had to fill the leadership vacuum created by his absence. My husband knew my thoughts and focused himself and me and our movement on the way forward. The first thing the next morning, there he was on the phone. Share these words with the members, he told me. Ignite the signal fire for Christianity according to the call of God. With that phone call, the leadership of the movement was now in mother's hands. With that one sentence, Father passed the torch and lit the way for Mother to go. At the start of each day, after he finished praying at 5 a.m., he would call me from a prison payphone and greet me with, My beloved Mother. I was permitted to visit him at the prison every other day. I would be driven there in a convertible, and when weather permitted, I would put the top down as we ascended the final hill on the prison grounds. Rain or shine, my husband always came out and waited for our arrival. 
With a longing heart, I would smile brightly and wave from the car. Sometimes he would look totally worn out, just having finished mopping the floor or washing dishes. What wife would feel comfortable seeing her husband like that? But I would suppress my sorrow and hug him with a bright smile. I often brought our two-year-old daughter, Jungjin, for he would be so happy to receive and embrace her. When our brief meetings ended, my husband would send us off. As we drove back down the hill, worried tears would start to fall from my eyes. Wishing not to turn my face toward him and expose my weeping, I would just keep my face forward while waving goodbye. I knew that my husband would remain in place, his eyes fixed upon me, a prayer in his heart, waving silently until we were out of sight. Mother was not only dealing with the burden of leading the movement, she was carrying the tender heart of a loving wife. So desperately worried about her husband's health and safety that she could not stop the tears from escaping her eyes. And as much as she would have wished to turn to see his face one last time, she hid her tears from him, not wanting to cause father concern and bring extra burden upon him. He was now depending on her to be strong and lead the movement. Doesn't this naturally make you reflect on what her experience was like just after father transitioned to the spirit world? Mother knew when father was nearing his end. Mother could sense father preparing to go. She knew what was coming next but could only think about holding back her tears so that he could go peacefully without worrying. Can you imagine what was in her prayers after father passed? She continually affirmed that she would take care of everything. She continually promised that she would bring about the fulfillment of the providence within her lifetime. As she offered this prayer of devotion to heaven, as she offered this prayer of commitment to Father in heaven, do you think that she cried? Did she cry tears of pain and concern? Did she cry tears of sadness and regret? She could not. Back in 1984, as a young mother of 14 children, waving goodbye to her husband at the Danbury gates after each visit, she turned her tears inward. She covered her face. But how about those long starry nights or the cold mornings in prayer up the hill behind Chunjungung? Did she expose her tears to the sky knowing that father was watching? I believe she did not. Of course, mother must have shed tears to our heavenly parent for the burdens that humanity is bringing upon heaven. Of course, true mother must have shed tears for our true father. Of course, mother must have shared tears of forgiveness to humanity for our ignorance and our slumber. But the truth is mother does not have anywhere to turn for her personal tears. There is no pillow that can absorb mother's tears in private. Her only tears are those of longing to reach all of God's children. In a sense, her experience with Danbury foreshadowed a course she would take after father passed into the spirit world. She had to take on the responsibility of leading despite the challenges and attacks. For the 13 months of Father Moon's imprisonment, I was coping with feelings of sorrow and injustice, but my responsibility to lead our church and the providence came first. I felt responsible for inspiring our members around the world while maintaining a firm axis with my husband, around which they would revolve unwavering in their life of faith. While father was imprisoned, the media continued to mock the movement and the critics were convinced that our movement 
would close its doors. Media professionals around the world gossiped and cynically predicted that the Unification Church would disappear. Some members of the media seemed to be anxiously waiting for that to happen, hoping to proclaim happily, we told you so, the Unification Church is an empty shell, cracking like an egg with nothing inside. Its so-called believers are heading for the hills. But Mother prevailed. She led the members with the unwavering heart of a loving parent. And the movement experienced a time of growth with new members and new allies joining the cause. Can you recognize how strong she must have been to, to lead us through that time? And how undoubtedly it prepared her even more for this time in the providence. So how about you? Can you recognize areas in your life today where you feel alone in the face of an uncertain future? Do you have to overcome doubts about what you are working on right now? Well, if you are united with heaven, if you're united with true mother and those she appoints to lead you, is there anything that God puts on your heart that you cannot accomplish? I don't think so. If we work together for the will, each with our own unique contribution, anything is possible if we just stick to it, just like mother. You have to declare your new age, your new self. What is it that heaven is guiding you to accomplish in line with the will? No matter how limited your visibility, no matter how scary it may feel, persevere. Just like a few years ago, when mother took over the leadership and felt like she was searching for a needle in a sandstorm. Despite our lack of understanding and support, she boldly declared herself. She boldly declared her commitment. She opened the era of Chan Il Guk and led the way for us all. So let us be like father and mother. Let us inherit from mother in this way. Why? Not just for yourself. Your offering should connect to the realm of liberation for mother's heart, just like mother and father have worked for the liberation of heavenly parents' heart. From a young age, she was a believer. She was a visionary. She knew the will of heaven and was determined to see it through. Even with the obvious attacks from Satan, she was then as she is now, 100% unwavering. She has the ability to condense all of the spirit, all of the truth, and all of the mission in just a few words. Her message to the members during those dark years in Danbury rings true for us today, as it did then. Listen. Our sincere devotion will bring Satan to surrender. Now is the time. History will record this as the welcoming of a new age. So there it is. God bless you and good luck.